Good morning. Good morning. Um, and thank you all very much for joining us this morning. Uh, my name is Steve McManaman, and I'd like to welcome you to today's event, which is part of the continuing series of the Greenwich Roundtable. Our, our topic this morning, uh, the efficient frontier today, machine or man and machine, is a continuation of the big data session we held in 2006. Uh, coming up with these titles is really important because we don't offer a description to tell you what you're about to hear. Uh, so um, originally, I wanted to um, call it Desperately Seeking Alpha, Man or Machine, or um, How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Algorithm. Uh, if, uh, if some of you don't know that movie, perhaps it was a Dr. Strangelove, Stanley Kubrick movie, <laughs> just as a footnote. Um, and and uh, so I was overruled, and more serious heads prevailed, and here we are today. So having said that, our speakers are amazingly smart, thoroughly different from one another, and I'll briefly introduce them. Uh, Jason Karp is the co-chief investment officer of Turbulon Capital Partners, an equity long short group based in New York City. Uh, before founding Turbulon, uh, Jason was the co-chief investment officer at Carlson Capital, where he co-managed portfolios alongside founder Clint Carlson. Before that, Jason was portfolio manager at the uh, SAC Capital and a partner and portfolio manager at George Weiss Associates. Uh, Mr. Kauf, excuse me, um, he is a trustee and co-chairman of the investment committee of overseeing Loomis Chafee's endowment. Is that correct? Okay. That's correct. Uh, outstanding. Uh, sitting next to Jason, uh, Tim Gary is the chief investment officer at Polaris Jack Capital, an equity long short fund based in San Francisco. Uh, that um, name is uh, uh, the strait where Captain Cook first made land. Very interesting. Uh, before that, um, Mr. Gary served as a portfolio manager and risk manager at Passport Capital, uh, also based in San Francisco. Uh, before that, Tim was the quantitative portfolio manager at State Street Global Advisors, uh, where he was responsible for quantitative modeling as well as developing portfolio construction techniques using both equities and equity derivatives. And uh, finally, Dr. Dario Volani is CEO of Duality Group, a software engineering company uh, based in New York. Uh, he's also a visiting lecturer at Princeton University. Uh, before starting Duality, Dario was the global head of portfolio strategy and risk at Tudor Investment Corporation. In 2006, he was named Buy Side Quant of the Year by Risk.net. Uh, he's managed multi-billion dollar portfolios in credit interest rates and commodities, and he's authored research papers in finance, theoretical physics, statistics, and portfolio management. And finally, uh, Ray Gustin is the moderator of the Greenwich Roundtable today, and he organized today's session. Uh, he's a trustee of the Roundtable and a long-serving member of our programming committee. And without further ado... Very good. Thank you, Steve. Much has been made of the underperformance of active management versus passive products in recent years. And this has been particularly true of hedge fund strategies in a market environment that has, notwithstanding recent conditions, basically been on an upward tear for nearly a decade. And yet, as of the end of 2017, hedge fund assets were at an all-time high of $3.2 trillion, compounding the issue of crowded trades. Are institutions diluting themselves, or have investable options available evolved to make room for more efficient alpha-driven strategies? That is a topic we will explore today as we hear from three managers, each of whom is executing a strategy that seeks to exploit inefficiencies and capture alpha through innovation and zig where others zag. While each of the, th of the three managers today executes a unique strategy, they all employ technology, including the use of alternative data sets and enhanced analytical tools to identify relationships and optimize or assist in the optimization of risk. We will explore their use of technology in the investment process and discuss and debate the future of active investing. Specifically, are we rapidly approaching a singularity beyond which machines outcompete humans as, a cure, as occurred in chess in 1997 when IBM's Deep Blue bested world chess champion Gary Kasparov, or in 2011 when IBM Watson beat the Jeopardy champions, or more recently in 2015 when Google DeepMind's AlphaGo 
won it go against world champion Lee Sodal. Now the computers have moved well beyond brute force data crunching and keyword search to true artificial intelligence. What are the implications for profitable investing? And if pushed to the limit, are we destined to reach a time where it becomes a fool's errand statistically to compete for alpha against computerized computers with generalized AI power? Jason Karp will kick us off today. Jason has built and managed both quantitative and human discretionary approaches over the years. At Turbion, Jason and his team identify longer horizon themes and invest in a concentrated set of themes that seek to capture longer-term trends while steering clear of the noise of short-term trading activity. We will then hear from Tim Gary. Tim developed a set of tools to track and evaluate various factor premia, and Pellerus Jack seeks to profit by correctly anticipating trends and trend reversal, reversals among such factors and stocks that share such factor characteristics. Tim and Pellerus Jack recognize investor behavior anomalies and trade on changes in relative moves in these biases. Dario Villani will wrap up our round of manager comments. Dario and his partners at Duality have developed a quantitative fund that employs machine learning AI techniques in an organic, bottom-up, rather than deterministic way to identify short-term relationships in data that lead to alpha signals. This is an emerging frontier of quant strategies, and Dario is well-suited to frame this exciting new area of quant fund re uh, research. After Dario's remarks, we will move to Q&A, so get your questions ready. We have plenty to discuss. Jason, please kick us off. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, I, I think maybe to kick it off, it might be helpful to give sort of context to how we got here. Um, and uh, I wanted to walk you through the evolution of, of quant and, and also my own career, which, which mimics it. Um, so I started uh, as a, I guess what they call a pure quant in 1998. Um, I went to a firm that was market neutral that specialized in quantitative investing at a time when there were only a few hundred hedge funds. Um, and my first job, or my first task on the job, was to explain to my bosses what happened with long-term capital, which was in the fall of 1998. And, uh, you know, I think Quant has had several iterations, um, or what I would call arms races, uh, and, and that was the first arms race that led up to the, the long-term capital problem. Uh, and there were only a few, you know, decent-sized, well-recognized quants prior to that. Uh, Renaissance, D.E. Shaw, Paloma, and the like. And most of these were spread-capturing, uh, statistical arbitrage type of quants, where you were trying to capture small amounts of spreads, usually market-neutral, and you needed a lot of leverage to make it look good. Um, this was also a time, and I think it's worth remembering, when uh, using Microsoft Excel was, was an edge. Uh, and, and having a Bloomberg was actually unusual. Um, and, and there were plenty of people, I remember, who when they wanted to get the 10K or the 10Q of a company would go to the public library. Uh, and so it was a very different time, and it was really the, kind of the beginnings of quant. And, uh, you know, this was also when uh, stocks traded in fractions. And having fractions made the market less efficient, uh, less continuous, uh, and there was actually less opportunity for small alphas because you had to cross bid off or spread every time you wanted to do something. After uh, 2002, um, so you kind of had this, uh, between long-term capital and 2002, you kind of had this vacuum. And then, and then after 2002, when people realized that stocks could go down and they could go down a lot, you know, you had a 50% drawdown uh, in the S&P from peak to trough uh, in 2002, there was tremendous demand uh, for market neutral strategies, quantitative strategies. Uh, and I'd say allocators and investors got much smarter about the difference between alpha and beta and trying to only pay for alpha and how do we measure alpha and how do we differentiate skill from luck. Um, and the other major thing that happened in 2002 was Regulation FD, um, which stands for Fair Disclosure, uh, where, where companies and hedge funds and, and asset managers could no longer get advantages for being a big commission payer. Uh, and that actually really leveled the playing fields for quants, uh, because prior to that, you know, fundamental managers legally could find out from management teams if they were going to meet or beat the quarter. Uh, and it was actually legal for them to tell you. 
Uh, it was also legal for the sell side to call you up and say, hey, I'm going to upgrade Yahoo tomorrow, and it's going to go up 50% when I upgrade it. Uh, and that's why a lot of hedge funds in that era were putting up 50 to 100% type of returns every year, because that was actually legal. Uh, after 2002, that was no longer legal, and that sort of stopped. And that, that's when arms race number two began, uh, which, which ultimately culminated uh, with Global Alpha, uh, which was Goldman Sachs's largest quantitative uh, business, uh, blowing up spectacularly in August of 07. Uh, Cliff Asnes is of Global Alpha fame. He left well before that happened. Um, and that type of quant was a different kind of quant. Uh, that's what, uh, what we call fundamental quant, where these quants are actually using fundamental variables from Ks and Qs, uh, things like gross margins, free cash flow yields, uh, balance sheets, uh, uh, valuations, uh, all things that were easily measurable um, that went back 30 or 40 years. And, you know, managers for, for a while, it did really well. But people were starting to use more and more leverage to make it look good. And ultimately, the longer term signals uh, that exist from fundamental quant became very, very crowded. And the reason they became crowded is because everyone was using the same data sets to figure out what's worked for the last 30 years. And, you know, buying cheap stocks and buying low PE stocks and shorting high PE stocks and uh, all sorts of variables like this became very easily. <laughs> Uh, understood by all the quants, and so everyone got into the same stuff, uh, and then they all started to use a lot of leverage, and then August of 07 happened where these quants that literally printed money with five sharp ratios um, had 20, 30, 40 percent drawdowns in a period when the market actually didn't move. Um, and so that created the next hangover. Um, uh, and then after 2009, arms race number three began. Um, and that's, I would say, we're kind of at the tail end of that right now. Um, and that's been going since 2009. Um, this has been defined by much shorter time horizons. Uh, so the fundamental variables that a lot of uh, quants were using in the 02 to 07 window, or I'd say everything prior to 07, you know, these are time horizons of a year, nine months, year and a half, two years at the extreme. Um, Whereas uh, post-09, most of the most profitable quants that I know of uh, are dealing in time horizons that are three months and less. Um, and you can go as, as short as high-frequency strategies that are literally market-making and making money every second uh, to some strategies that have longer time horizons that are typically two weeks or a month or two months. Um, and the big difference that's happened over the last seven, eight years has been there's been much more access to data. There's been much better speed in processing that data, and obviously the rise of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And, you know, the, the kind of data that is capturable now is really staggering. Um, and, and some of you probably have heard, and some of you haven't, uh, that, that basically any app or any service uh, that collects your data, um, so any app that you use on your phone, you probably don't realize you are giving them data, uh, especially if it's free. Um, and, and certainly you guys have heard what's happened with Facebook recently, uh, but this is happening with, with almost every app that you use. And, and what a lot of these apps, it really started with a company called Mint, um, which does a lot of personal finance tracking for you in terms of your bank accounts, your credit cards, and putting it all in one place. Mint figured out that they could start selling their data anonymously, uh, so it doesn't have your name on it, uh, to hedge funds. Um, and hedge funds will pay staggering amounts of money for people's credit card data because you can actually figure out how many people are eating at Chipotle every day and how many people are eating at Chipotle every day in Union Square in New York and how many of those are women and how many of those are men. And after they go to Chipotle, where do they go next? And all of this data is actually available today. You have to pay for it, and these companies will sell it, but you have to pay for it. Um, there's satellite imagery data, which actually uh, they use drones and they use various satellites to, to hover or track parking lot activity. So you can actually see how many cars are in various parking lots all around the country for various stores. You could see how many Tesla cars are moving out of the distribution center into the warehouses. All of this stuff is trackable now. Um, and it's important to recognize that because... 
you know, as it, and I'll, I'll sort of now reach my conclusion, um, you, you have to know what, what quants and machines can do and what they're very good at, but you also have to recognize, uh, and, and at this point, you know, I, I w moved out of being what I would call a pure quant in 2002 to more of a discretionary manager that uses quant to enhance our investment process around 2002. So for about 16 years, uh, they now call this quantamental, which is combining quant and fundamental. But for about 16 years, that's what I've been doing. And it's gotten harder and harder and harder in the short term, meaning call it six months and less, uh, for fundamental managers, because a lot of this data is being ingested by the best and the biggest quants. And the firms like Two Sigma and Renaissance, and then even some of the fundamental firms that have huge quantitative efforts like Millennium and SAC and Citadel, uh, some of them are spending upwards of $200 million a year on data. Uh, and so, ironically, while Reg FD sort of leveled the playing field, what's going on recently, and there's actually a lot of debate whether the SEC is going to crack down on this, uh, a lot of that level playing field stuff has reversed again because the firms who can spend the most amount of money can actually get real edge with this data. Uh, but the good news for fundamental managers like myself is that this is all very short-term stuff. And there are, you know, I think there's a lot of reasons to be skeptical about short-term uh, fundamental hedge funds. Uh, the, the quantitative aspect is one, but just simple competition, you know, there's now tens of thousands uh, of, of people trying to exploit these things. There's over 10,000 hedge funds, and there's certainly tens of thousands of individual quants who are working out of their apartments. Uh, there's a business called Quantopia that, that basically fosters this, um, where you if, you if you develop a strategy out of your own apartment that seems to make money, they'll sponsor you. Um, so from a competition perspective, you have to recognize what, what we're playing in. Uh, but the positive is, and I'll conclude on a happy note for those of you who are who are fundamental, um, because I think these two can coexist. And I think there's a lot of money to be made in the very short time horizons with the best quants, which hopefully you'll hear from the, the gentleman to my left, who are, are particularly Dario, uh, are, are probably more in that zone. But on the fundamental side, in the longer term, there's a lot of things that quants still can't do. And I use the word still very carefully, because one of the questions that Ray brought up in our discussion was, you know, is there, a, is there a moment in 20 years or so when this turns into the Matrix, you know, or the Terminator, when all of a sudden the machines take over? But for now, I'll say that quants cannot do things that don't have a precedent very well. So if something's never happened before, like the rise of Netflix, um, they're not particularly good at figuring that out. You know, there's never been a company that's risen as quickly as Netflix in terms of, of uh, and, and certainly in the business model that they've done where they've decided to spend $8 billion on content hoping that lots of people would subscribe to their service. Um, so they're not particularly good with that. They're not particularly good with long time horizon activity. And so the example I give on this, which, which was actually something we did, um, was most people don't remember this, but in 2014 was a terrible year for Amazon. Uh, and if you had on long Amazon, short Walmart, and that year you lost almost 50%. If you held it for the, for the next three years, you've made several hundred percent by keeping that on. Uh, but there's periods, and decent, you know, a good year, sometimes year and a half, there's decent periods where trends look one way, but if you can have imagination about how the world is evolving, and, and certainly everyone in this room would recognize that Amazon would dominate Walmart even four years ago, you know, Time Horizon definitely solves all ills. Um, and then uh, act, uh, um, quants don't do anything as it relates to privates, uh, so there's still a lot of opportunity in, in private things where you actually can't trade, uh, and activism. You know, so activism where you're actually changing the course of a company uh, and you're influencing the outcome of that company, um, they can't do that either. And so I think it's worth remembering that stocks are companies at the end of the day, and capitalism still works, and you'll always have winners and losers. Um, but you have to recognize what game you're playing in and where you want to play and where you don't want to play. So I'll stop there. Very good. <clears throat> Jason, I've just got one follow-up question, sure. and that is, 
What are the implications that you see for managing risk for your portfolio? In other words, are you seeing uh, more volatility if you are investing over the long term? Do you have to, uh, you know, sp- uh, how do you manage those positions tighter now than you might have in the past? Yeah. So, so a lot has changed in the last five years, um, and and you know, my career and and I've had to evolve probably three or four times over the twenty years that I've been managing money. Um, the last three or four years in particular, you have to be much more aware of which companies trade on data, meaning which companies actually have data available that other people can buy that will then trade on that data because, you know, they call this a data path. But there's a number of companies, for example, where we've had difficulty in the short term where the data is going one way, but the fundamental long-term view is the opposite. So, for example, you take a name like, uh, this actually happened with Mattel. Um, So a couple years ago, about a year and a half ago, um, Mattel, which is the second largest toy company behind Hasbro, they make Barbie. Um, Mattel was going through some really difficult things uh, on the fundamental side. They lost their license, um, their Barbie license. Sorry, they lost the Disney princess license to Hasbro. And if any of you have daughters, you know how important the Disney princesses are, which includes the entire library of every Disney princess from, like, Cinderella all the way up to Elsa in Frozen. And I have a daughter, and so I know this. And uh, after they lost the license, which was a huge deal, it was a material part of their franchise, they started excessively promoting uh, Barbies because that's what they had. And logically, why would they spend any time on promoting an aspect of their franchise that they were losing? So the data um, that you could capture, which was in point-of-sale data and credit card data, was showing that Barbie sales were accelerating. And because Barbie is the most material aspect of their business, a lot of machines were buying Mattel. And this went on for a good four months. And so we were shorting it and shorting it and getting hurt every week as it was going up. Then when Mattel ultimately reported, um, they had good Barbie sales but terrible margins because they were excessively promoting it. And the margins and the markdowns were not captured in the data, but the sales were captured in the data. Mattel had its biggest down move in 20 years on what was not so bad of of an earnings print, simply because it got so packed and crowded with machines. And so, and then they all had to reverse course. Um, And so I think the major thing that you have to pay attention to, that we didn't have to pay attention to, is... Are quants playing this? What do they see that we don't see? And recognizing that there's certain games we just don't play anymore because there's either too much noise, in which case it's unanalyzable, or frankly, the quants have a lot more data than we do on very short-term activity, and we just don't want to compete with them because we can't. Very good. Tim, please. Yeah, I think um, Jason did a very good job summing up uh, a long period of time. I kind of come into the picture, kind of a cliff assness, market neutral, long short fundamental, quant, running 300 names aside, tilting value momentum. Post that, I went to work for John Burbank, where I was the chief risk officer for six years. I uh, ran a, a fundamental long short fund there, and then I started Polaris Jack. I'm going to focus my comments largely on the last two years. The reason being is if you asked me 18 months ago what the market looks like versus asking me today, I would tell you the exponential change is so rapid that you can't even compare the two. So for example, if we think about markets 11 years ago, and we think about US trading volumes, 41% of daily volume was discretionary fundamental managers, people who knew and had a view on stock specific risk. That number today is less than 10%. So the way I like to define the world is systematic um, plus company specific risk equals total risk. Right? And that company-specific risk now is much less of a focus than it used to be. 90% plus of daily volumes now are systematically focused. And we define that as passive, quant leverage, ETFs, smart beta, CTAs, structured selling of all, risk premia, uh, all types of factor trading. So unfortunately, um, my message is not an optimistic one. I think we've gone way too far, and I've never seen more opportunity on the idiosyncratic standpoint. I've never seen bigger company-specific mispricings. 
But the reality is because flows are now dominated by factor trading, and Andrew Ang has basically <coughs> espoused the premise that basically all asset allocation should be done in accordance with style factors, um, I think the marginal setter of price is no longer on a daily basis someone who understands fundamentals, right? So let's, let's dive in on that a little bit. I think the last truly fundamental quarter from the way I see it was first quarter 2017. You can think about first quarter 2017 as largely buying Amazon long and shorting retailers against it. And so basically that was a view of buying growth stocks, shorting value, right? In April of 2007, suddenly price momentum, which is buying the strongest stocks and shorting the worst stocks, clicks in. And essentially for the rest of 2017, what you see is a linear extrapolation where momentum, if you're buying momentum, which is what all these products at BlackRock and Risk Premier are doing, you are buying growth and you are shorting value. And so if you look at 12 month momentum, taking the last 12 month price trend of stock, what you will find is it's 0.9 correlated to growth and minus 0.9 correlated to value. Unfortunately, the story gets worse because not only is growth and momentum correlated, but quality is correlated to growth and momentum. How does a quant define quality? A traditional fundamental quant defines quality as high profitability and low leverage. Well, that's not how I define quality as a fundamental manager. So if you take the Russell 1000 and you rank on quality, you will find Ben, the asset manager, is the number one ranked quality company in the US in Russell 1. And number two is Bed Bath & Beyond, okay? So from my perspective, our second biggest holding is Charter Communications. What has Charter got? It has leverage. I'm comfortable with the leverage because it has lots of recurring revenue. But more importantly, it ranks low quality because they're trying to minimize gap EPS so they don't pay taxes and they maximize free cash flow so they can buy back 70% of float in the next four years, right? Charter has very good earnings on the quarter, trades up. What happens? The next day, it starts drifting all the way down where it's gone from almost 400 to 300, purely on systematic flows, which are betting against quality, which are betting in favor of momentum, which are betting against value. So what I would tell you, and you know, if you looked at a spreadsheet and you looked month by month since first quarter 2007, the growth factor in decile terms in the Russell 1, has not had a month where it's had a minus one return. It is completely normal for the growth factor, growth stocks, to have minus 5% monthly returns, and for the momentum factor to have a minus 10% return. We've had 16 months in a row where the growth factor has essentially been positive or down less than 1%. And momentum has been positive the whole time. Now here's the issue. New law changes, you want carried interest. You're a fundamental manager, your turnover is already probably the lowest it's been in 15 years. So what do you incentivize to do now if you're a fundamental manager? Turn even less. What does that mean? That means you're gonna be even a lower setter of marginal price. So essentially, I would have told you a year ago, my business model is I model quant, and what modeling quant really means is figure out which sectors, industries, and style factors have positive and negative risk premiums, <clears throat> map that to global macro, and understand under which macro regimes those style factors will work, and then be long the tailwinds by doing bottom-up fundamental work, be short the headwinds. In theory, that's a great idea. The problem is there is so much systematic capital now on the margin that the real arbitrage to fundamental is time. So I'll give you another example. The largest holding we have is Energy Transfer Partners. It's the MLP of ETE. In 2016, when Kelsey Warren tried to merge Williams and ETE, um, the whole thing almost went bankrupt. In February of 2016, crude was trading at $26, and the bonds of ETP were trading at 70 cents. Today, ETP's stock price is trading at a lower value with its bonds at 99 to 111. And its coverage ratio and interest has gone from 0.9 to 
and I'm getting a 14% dividend yield to belong it. So how does that happen? And right? oil, oil 60. And oil 70, Brent's yeah, 70, yeah. And so how does that happen? I'll tell you how it happens. The very basic fundamental quant is overly simplistic. We do it, so I understand this. So take REITs, for example, or towers. They should be modeled on AFFO. A traditional quant doesn't go to that extent. They model it on growth. It screens as a high growth stock. So if we want a short growth factor, we want to short towers. That makes no sense. Take it the other way, an MLP, a traditional quant, fundamentally, will model on book to price. Well, the book to price of ETP is 0.75. So if I showed you the last 18 months on a chart, what you would see is that growth stocks have done 30% in aggregate, value stocks have done minus 22, and momentum has done 20 plus. So we now live in this world where, from my perspective, company-specific fundamentals are heavily discounted by all of these systematic flows. And I think even John Vogels recently said, wow, this really doesn't make sense. Here's another way of thinking about it. Last year, when growth stocks became correlated to momentum, when something becomes correlated with momentum, its volatility tends to decline because flows pour into it. So all of your high beta, high growth stocks last year moved to the low beta bucket. They became the safe thing, right? That makes no sense. I love Netflix, but if they miss subscriber growth on a quarter, it doesn't belong where, you know, at a one beta. And so um, the other thing I would say is risk models are quite simply, in the traditional fundamental world, comprised of two things. Historical volatility and historical correlations. Well, what we are finding is that the correlations between style factors, growth value, momentum, quality, are changing so dynamically as a function of what the quants are doing that a traditional equity long short risk model is completely garbage in, garbage out. You know, you might, you might as well do this now, right? So it's important that we do the historical modeling with the risk models, but you now have to have a very forward looking view on risk. Um, what I would say personally is I think systematic risk has never been more mispriced than any time in my career. I think also what you've got to think about is what did QE ultimately do? It truncated tail risk. The Fed put in a put so markets couldn't fall too far. Well, since about 2013, there has been a tremendous amount of systematic strategies that have emerged. Systematic selling of all, risk parity, risk premia, factor trading. What do all of these strategies do? They piggyback on QE. They contract risk premia. They basically are a doubling down of QE, right? So I think we've just started to see the blowing up, kind of like 2007 of those systematic strategies, with the systematic sellers of vol blowing up. Last year, the 50-day realized vol of the NASDAQ 100 <coughs> bottomed at 5.8%. That's absurd. Now, 50-day vol on the queues post, um, post February yes. is 30. 30. So now the NASDAQ is realizing a 50-day vol of 30. Something has dramatically changed. Financial conditions are starting to tighten. And I think what we're going to find is many of these systematic strategies are just another source of beta. The, other thing I, the last thing I would end with is if you are long growth and you are long momentum, and you are short value, that's beta. Because it's, it's been ingrained in the market for 15 months. You shouldn't be paying for that, just buy the Qs. That's what that is. The Qs have a higher sharp. And so as an absolute return manager, what I see my job is to do is, typically I don't want to be contrarian, I want to be coincidental, I want to invest alongside the trends, but it's become so extreme and so ingrained um, that this is the one time that I'm actually extraordinarily contrarian and I'm predicting or making a call that we are going to see a momentum crash. Very interesting, Tim. I guess the follow-up question I'd have is, what conditions would you be looking for to see this uh, kind of uh, discontinuity yeah. in these uh, correlations? Yeah, so Jason, I probably share, you know, he, he having worked at SAC, you're probably pretty familiar with DeMarket indicators. Yes. So we run DeMarket indicators, which are market timing indicators on factors. 
and they're fractal in nature, which means you can run these indicators on a daily time series, a weekly time series, a monthly time series. The longer time series you go, the more it's expressing a longer term trend. In the last three weeks, I have finally gotten my sell signals on DeMarc for price momentum, which are basically, if I back test those to the prior few times I've gotten them, um, have led to at least a 10% dislocation in momentum at minimum, sometimes 25. On top of that, we run a lot of factor crowding signals. One of the ones we do is we take the momentum factor scores and we correlate it to short interest. And what we find is that the correlation between price momentum as a factor and the short interest factor presently in the, in the US is minus 0.25 which tells you two things. A, nobody wants to be short momentum, but B, what we find statistically is when that number drops below 0.2, the statistical significance of a momentum crash elevates significantly. The last time we saw that, that kind of value uh, was first quarter 16. I don't think I can ascribe to you what a minus 10% momentum month in combination with a minus 5% growth month will look like to your average portfolio. Morgan Stanley's our fund administrator. We get 70 managers in a pilot program where I get their aggregate factor exposures. To a T, everybody is long momentum, long growth, short value, short dividend yield, because if you're not, you're not making money. And this industry has become so short-term focused on making money that you have either two choices, risk going out of business but having a windfall profit at some point, or play the game and chase momentum. Very good. Dario. Um, thank you for having me. Um, <clears throat> I don't know, I want you to talk about something else, but you know, after listening, <laughs> after listening to them, like, it really feels to me like the way quants are depicted, they are depicted like Newton or Galileo, and actually quantum mechanics is here. So let me give you a little bit of where we are in terms of artificial intelligence and modeling and measuring correlation, portfolio construction, and all of that. Like up until last year, I was at Tudor. And people would come to me sometime and say, you know, most equity market news will have a sharp of two. You guys have a sharp of one. Why should I leave the money in it? Or why would I ever invest? Because, you know, when, especially when you listen to very articulate discretionary traders. They describe humans as having this amazing judgment and uh, the machines are these obtuse, backward looking, you know, objects. And my answer was always like, yes, the sharp, we have less sharp, but humans at the turns are better and more, much more prospective in nature. Not because, this is a subtle point, not because a Paul Tudor Jones can actually forecast the data break or the, the paradigm shift. It's that contingent on the data break happening, Paul can on the fly decide to shorten the time scale at which he considers things relevant and decide to forget everything else. So this is a brand new world and he's going to fight it. So traditional quant, that was the weakness, it was extremely vulnerable to data break and paradigm shift. Why? Because, you know, as they were saying, you measured correlation. Ultimately, they had to decide what was the time scale of which to remember or forget things, what was the time scale of which to measure beta, what was the time scale of which to measure correlation. And, you know, they would do fancy things, could be exponential moving average, six months, one year, but fundamentally, they, they had to choose one. And they couldn't be adaptive about it. Now, if you think of the other weakness that the systematic trading had, that is very much like Galileo and Newton kind of quant work, was you always started with the model of the world. You had to postulate a model of the world. You say the world is mean reversing, the world is trending. The world is a mix of the two. And then the rest was, let's estimate the parameters of the models, and let's bet that the world going forward is going to look very much like the world we calibrated our model on, and let's hope for the best, and if the world doesn't 
happen to be like that, maybe the other model is going to work, and so on and so forth. The reality is that this is the quantitative model that is typical of top-down, godlike modeling. Humans sit down around the table and decide, this is the model of the world, let's just estimate, and then we're going to decide when to turn it off. We're going to be faced with the question, is really the world like this or not? The new machine learning is the opposite of that. It's the opposite of top-down modeling. It's evolutionary. You don't fix a model of the world. You don't even fix the time scale of which you remember or forget things. It's very much human in nature with the added advantage of doing proper statistical inference. And if you look at the result, like, yeah, we can talk about, you know, of course it's the field is about to explode, but the reality is machine learning with a few drops of blood can draw the face of each one of you. You know, you couldn't have a driverless car with good judgment and linear regressions. And so what I'm trying to say that the, in the new world of machine learning, you don't have a model of the world, you don't even have a time scale over which you have to decide to remember or forget things. You can deal with extreme and rare events. You can be prospective. And you can be even, you can have a form of artificial intelligence that it's aware of its own learning. That is the basis for having markets that are reflexive. And what I want to say that <coughs> if you think, and I want to really tackle at once the issue of machine versus humans, the four steps of trading are data, the forecast, the portfolio optimization, portfolio construction, how do you build a cogent portfolio, and execution. Let's look at each one of them separately. Data. If you have five data set, yeah, maybe humans have a chance of adding some value. There are banks that offer 35,000 data set. If you want to use 10 data set out of them, do you know how many tentacles you can extract out of 35,000 data sets? is 10 to the power hundreds. It's trillions. Can humans really, with all the non-linear stuff, all the redundancy, can humans beat a machine in choosing the tentable out of 35,000 data set better than a machine? Absolutely not. Let's look at the forecast. There is no question that humans, if they do work in you know, special states or like activists, of course, they can do better. They have access to information that machines don't have access to. And I concede that. But they are really glossing over all the opportunities. A discretionary trader will never go after the 51, 49 bet. It wouldn't even, the, the coarseness of the instrument wouldn't be able even to see that there is a 51, 49 bet. Portfolio construction. If you do enough work in uh, trading, one thing you learn and realize, everybody talks about, there is low signal to noise. That means that no matter how much data you do, how much you study the covenants, there is a cap of your ability to improve your forecast. Yeah, you can go from 55, 45 to 56. You're never gonna get to 80, 20. So ultimately, what makes medallion medallion, it's not the forecast becomes 80-20. How do you assemble in a cogent way a bunch of signal in a portfolio that doesn't have tails? And the way to do that, humans can't. How do you take into account all the other parts around the model, all the other parts around the matrices, the correlation? How do you take into account tails, contingent densities? Like, that's the art. This dream of the West Coast that you can have a success rate of 98%, it just doesn't happen. So if we concede that the best we can do is in the 50s, the rest is portfolio construction, and humans are definitely terrible at it. Last one, it's execution. Again, whoever has been sitting with a discretionary bunch of guys know that if there is one person is one player that is easy to pick off is the person who picks up the phone. Say, 
I really need to buy 200 million. Oh, let me help you out here. And everybody knows. So execution, there is incredible research. You know, HL Main has done amazing work with multi-armed bandit problem. So what I'm trying to say that, in my opinion, and I give you an anecdote, humans, apart from very specific situation, like, you know, you know, like activism, you know, covenant, distress situation, work, uh, workout reorgs and so I think they have no chance. And the people, they think that is the opposite. I really remember, like, I, from a poor village in Italy, my dad had a friend that was a little bit wealthier. And the son bought the car in uh, 1982 with the ABS system, the anti-blockage system. And for a couple of years, my dad and his friend were arguing at the bar that their way of braking was safer than the ABS. The way they would touch that pedal, it just was much more control, judgment, and there was a mix of experience that you can't buy. The reality is, it just if you look forward, if you try to do that in Formula One, you will never win the Grand Prix, and you are just doomed to fail. And uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dario, a, a, ba a basic question that I think yeah. many of us have, that I have, with a uh, kind of a, 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 we'll call it an organic or machine oh. learning strategy, yeah. is how do you know when it's not working? Actually, when I was, this, this is the, the right point. Working and not working is actually the main discretionary element in systematic trading, paradoxically. Because when you do traditional systematic trading, you have three degrees of freedom. You choose the model of the world, or the mix of model of the world. You choose the time window over which you do the statistics. And you choose the level where you finally decide to stop the machine. You say, if I lost enough money, or my investor calls me and says, I'm sick of you losing money. Or you do it in a fancy way, they say, if the p-value is below 5%, I turn it off. But it's discreet. Why 5%? Why not 1%? Why not 10%? The problem is you are faced at some point with the question, what if my model of the world is altogether just wrong? I thought it was misreverting. We are in a world in which things trend. In machine learning, you don't choose the model. You have an inf infinite all of the model of the world. And what happens is only the weights change. And dynamically, you change the weights, so models get delivered, delivered automatically. In that machine can't be obstinate about the picture of the world because it doesn't have one. So I, I give this example that is very important. And this is the way humans are. When we, the first time we met, Ray was extremely abrasive. I started to talk, and he was like, what do you know about Sharp of Two? You look weird, you have an accent, whatever. <laughs> so he had this prior, there was 99 full of it, and maybe there was a 1% chance I was a good guy. So as I kept talking, he started changing the weights, and at some point went, flipped the other way, and then he called me and said, you want to come to the round table? <laughs> so the problem is, the big... <laughs> The leverage risk that, you know, we were talking about, like quant being leveraged, doing everything, it comes that from the basic fact that at heart, systematic trading, traditional systematic trading, removes the biggest source of uncertainty, that is model uncertainty. It just says the uncertainty of the assets. Instead, machine learning brings that back in. So the model is contemplative about all the plausible model of the world, but that p creates a lot of self-regularization. So you are never obstinate about it. That's the, the key element that, in my opinion, makes this form of modeling extremely different from everything else that you have ever seen. Yeah. Can I ask a two-part question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the things we've noticed in the last year as money's <clears throat> flooded into the systematic space broadly is that time series are no longer stationary. How do you, does, does that affect you? Does it matter? Yeah, that's, so that's what makes systematic trading and what give an edge to humans because ultimately time series are non-stationary, especially for markets. 
And so what is non-stationarity? You need constantly to change the time scale of which you look at things. Say, you look at six months, three months, you need to find a way endogenously to decide what's the time scale to look at. And that's the biggest thing where machine learning can actually solve it. And instead, it's extremely dangerous for traditional systematic training. Yeah, because we're seeing you know, macro variables to style factors go from R squares of 0.37 for a three month period to yeah. zero three months later. Yeah, not, imagine yeah. like imagine you trade stocks in 2007, you, everybody was obsessed with where the IG index is. Like the stock would track tick for tick the IG. Like it was the credit index. Nowadays, there are a bunch of traders that go home and don't even know if IG open wide, close wider or tight. Nobody cares. Because what drives things changes over time. That's the biggest problem. People talk about factor. At the end of the day, it's like, it's a low rank representation of the world that explains certain amount of volatility. But what is the proper subspace? It's a self function of the world. There is thresholding going on. Sometime above a certain level, that subspace is good. Below a certain level, another subspace is good. You can't have a static representation of the world in a world that constantly change. And that's why you really need, you know, a prospective in nature, self-aware, doubting and self-doubting with all the demons like humans, form of artificial intelligence that has all the demons of humans and self-doubt, but does proper statistical inference that humans can do. People always, like one thing of evolution, as humans, we evolved to survive. And I told this to Paul once, a large percentage of our brain is visual cortex. Why? Because we can recognize snake in the grass or evil people in banks. <laughs> and that's a large percentage of our brain. Like our brain didn't evolve for millions of years to do the Bayesian statistics of a multivariate distribution of returns, right? And that's why that snake looks very much like the head and shoulder of technical pattern. That's why humans are drawn to that. It's the same reason they recognize snakes. <laughs> But, you know, snakes are good to avoid, to survive, but if you follow patterns, it's a disaster. Second part of the question, on the margin, do you think you're making security pricing more or less efficient, or it's not even relevant? It's definitely more efficient because, you know, the mix of model, of course, <laughs> there is part of it that definitely provides liquidity. Mm -hmm. Part of it follows on the trend. But the reality is this new form of, you know, quantitative methods is making the system less fragile. Because the reality is that the quantitative traders, as much as people believe there is diversification, there is also a school of thought. Uh, the people at this show, some of them went to Tudor, some from Tudor went to Graham, some from Graham went to BCG. They all build the signal more or less the same way. They all use the same exponential moving average. And when the quant quake comes, they all get taken to the cleaners. It said adaptive, self-doubting form of artificial intelligence with big error bars, it's not in the same traits. So it's deploying capital in a way that doesn't create the system to be as fragile as it would be if you just do an arm raise in leverage or speed. So it adds another dimension. It opens up the world of nonlinear effects. Because at the end, what machine learning does, it unlocks all the nonlinear stuff. The reality is the industry has gone to 3.2 trillion. All the linear stuff, it's so hard, there's so much leverage that you need to open up the world of non-linear effects and the other bars and stuff. So I would say less fragile and definitely increase, you know, the, the liquidity of the markets. All right, very good. Now I think we can open things up. Uh, we got some very sharp guys here, so who would like to start us off? Go ahead, Ryan. Jason, you mentioned $200 million per year research um, for uh, budgets for the uh, data. Um, Dario, you're starting a new firm. How does that make you feel in terms of your ability to use those people? <clears throat> uh, you know, I have to say a lot of this, it's... The same, reason, the same people who say there is low signal to noise, they seem to buy every data in the world. Like, I don't get it. 
like everybody in this room understands, if I buy 35,000 data set, my ability to forecast doesn't go up a factor of 1,000. So it means underneath there is a lot of redundancy. The effective rank and dimensionality of the data set is way smaller than that. And every time people can make money, they talk about parking lots, satellite images. I've seen it everywhere. Like, oh, I'm losing money. The environment is challenging. Let me buy some parking lot data. <laughs> I mean, and people who can do linear regression on a spreadsheet to buy parking lot, it's ridiculous. I think a lot of this arms race, it's, it's, it depends. If you choose the proper time scale, people cause, the reality is people have having a hard time understanding which data set are relevant. And uh, in linear world, it's very easy. If I send you two time series and I send you a third one that is the sum of the two, you would recognize it immediately. But when there is no linear stuff, if I send you my height and weight and I send you my BMI with a little bit of noise, you wouldn't recognize it. If I send you X and X squared, you would think the correlation is zero. It is zero, but if you know X, you know X squared. So the only way you, you can do forecast as a human, you can do forecast as a machine or traditional trading. When you have to make an assessment which data set you need to buy, you need to use machine learning because unless you can see through the nonlinear effects, you're just going to buy stuff, and we haven't. And short of that, too, a lot of these data sets get arbed in, like, weeks' times. Like, I would build signals seven years ago that, like, within three quarters, they were, they were done. So I think, like, parking lots and credit card data. I yeah, the like, parking lots. <laughs> do, you, do you know anybody that's used no. parking lots? <laughs> three, th I'd say three to four years ago, this data was a good form of edge, but now it's become kind of table stakes. So every multi-manager <coughs> subscribes to it. You know, any manager, they, they just want to, they need to know what other people are looking at. So there's very, very little alpha in these data sets now, and the only people getting rich off it are the people who are selling you the data. Yeah. Very good. Uh, I think we had another, oh, Albert, go ahead. Yeah, well, once the, the question of the dairy, uh, you know, once you have a new system that's well trained, some sort of Actually, So to answer to that, one is that, like, you know, of course you get lulled into belief that you understand it better because, you know, if you choose the model, the tweaks are easy and then you understand it better. But the reality is the most difficult question you get always confronted with is, it, is was it right or wrong? You, had, you know, it's constantly, that's a hard question to answer. As far as we actually found a way to have proper representation of the, so it is hard, but can be done. So ultimately, it seems so black box, but what the neural net actually is doing is doing simply thresholding. Nonlinear seems a very complex thing. The simplest nonlinear function is the hockey stick. Linear above a certain level and flat before that. And any nonlinear effect can be represented as an infinite sum of hockey stick. So what the neural nets does is say, if the 30-day moving average is above the 50-day moving average, volatility is, you know, feels be the volume are drying up. If this feature goes above this threshold, then this region gets light up. So if you do like what in uh, image uh, in, uh, for, you know, MRI, like saliency maps, you can isolate parts of the feature space that are actually very traditional. It's just there are triggers, but the triggers are themselves a function of time. But in reality, even great discretionary trader like, would say if this happened, this happened, and this is above that, 
then I'll do this. So it actually, a lot of work can be done in terms of understanding. You don't need to give up on that in the short. Uh, yes, go ahead, and then we'll come to you, Bill. Go ahead, please. overlap with other markets and sometimes have different criteria, for example, corporate acquisitions or private equity transactions or even, for example, acquisitions of products by, let's say, pharmaceutical companies. So could you discuss a little bit how you see the limitations of this in terms of other overlapping markets for these assets and how you would minimize adverse exposures to different paradigms of valuation that might wind up uh, ultimately proving you know, giving a complete lie to a signal that comes out in, in daily trade. And I think, this, that, I think this, that question is broad because each for of For everybody, uh, for me, I don't know. You want to take well, it? Go ahead, Jason. I mean, look, that's, that's why I think um, – uh, and look, like, I actually think we all agree on this panel. Um, uh, so we, we certainly, Dario, we certainly I, – I certainly wasn't – meaning to sound anti-quant, I was meaning to say that I think there are certain things that humans cannot compete with. So I actually agree on the short term. Um, I, I think it, it, to your question, I think that's a real risk to full black box uh, AI or machine learning quant. If there is, if there is an impending, uh, let's call it a corporate action-based paradigm shift, like, say, the tax regime, which was one of them, um, where as soon as, as soon as the new tax bill passed, a lot of things changed very quickly. And um, the speed with which quants could figure out which companies will actually make the most money in the new tax regime, not which stocks are acting well, but which comp companies will actually make the most amount of money in this new tax regime, that's something machines probably had a very hard time figuring out. Um, and certainly when you get into aspects of M&A and what this asset's ultimately <laughs> worth, I mean, we're along a particular stock right now uh, that we love um, that uh, it's called Shire. It's based in the U.K. Uh, Shire uh, got to the cheapest it's ever been in its corporate history as of about a month ago. Um, and, and specifically to what Tim said, it screened as absolutely rock bottom on quantitative factors. Big negative momentum, lots of value, not much growth, and we believed that there was, uh, at a price, that this company would be broken up or get taken private. And in the last, you know, we suffered for a year holding this thing, and in the last two weeks, a Japanese pharmaceutical company called Takeda came in with a bid. And we've made back everything we lost in two weeks, but we had to stomach it for a year. And it's been, uh, I think it's a very good question. Um, and it requires a fundamental manager, uh, and frankly, quantitative managers, to try to understand what are things where, because um, the, the, the beauty about being long certain stocks is the, the factors or whatever, whatever the machines are recognizing, this is what's working and this is what isn't working, because at the end of the day, these are optimizing to be in what's working. Um, the beauty about recognizing that these are companies is at some point the market forces come into play and, you know, either the company realizes it's too cheap and they take it private or private equity realizes it's too cheap and they take it private or the company breaks itself up because it doesn't make sense. Um, you just have to be alive for when that happens. I, I'm going to say something that's going to be incredibly unpopular in this room. <laughs> I'm just going to couch it with that. So we measure illiquidity using a statistic called Amihud's illiquidity measure. And essentially, we run it across the Russell 1. We take the bid-ask spread for every security um, for trading a million dollars in each security, and then we aggregate it. And what you can basically see is that if you bought illiquidity in 2008 or early 2009, there was a tremendous risk premium associated with it. Now, given what 10 years of QE has done, and basically global central banks owning 40% of GDP, GDP, there is no risk premium left associated with illiquidity. So as I see people run into privates in illiquid funds in real estate, I just think it's the absolute wrong time to be doing that because even in the stock market, which is somewhat liquid, 
there is no risk premium associated with owning illiquidity. So if you're going to buy something illiquid, you better get the security selection right because you're not getting comped for the illiquidity. Um, and also, I would say, look, we're eight or nine years into an economic cycle. Maybe we go another two years. Maybe we don't. But the last thing I want to own in a deep, sharp downturn is illiquidity. I think we've seen how that plays before. And then I also think you have to think, with the amount of money that's in passive, if that's your funding source because you can't sell your real estate and your illiquid assets, well, pairwise correlation between stocks can rise quite sharply, and passive can act as basically an instrument of one. Interesting. Very good. Bill. Uh, just, you know, Jason, you were here two or three years ago, and you said something that I thought was really interesting about <clears throat> the number of people who work at hedge funds, analysts. It was something, I'm going to paraphrase it, you said, it, you know, there's like five or 6,000 people who work at hedge funds, and there's five or 6,000 people who work on Wall Street as sell side analysts and traditional hedge funds. And you sort of noted that, you know, 20 years ago when you started, I don't know what the ratio was, but it wasn't anywhere near that. And it was sort of a topic about how competitive it was and how hard it is to get at it. You know, that was generally the point. And Gary, you just said, you know, that 90% of the, of the marginal price setting is now systematic, which seems to say that being, you know, that, that being fundamental doesn't matter anymore. And so my question to, to all of you guys is, when is it the pendulum go far enough? You know, is 90% far enough to go to 95 or 98 for being a fundamental guy to be you know, the last milkman is actually a valuable thing? You know, where are we in that continuum that being the fundamental, you know, risk, you know, whether it's quantum mental or, you know, somewhat fundamental, when is that going to matter? I, I would say the time arbitrage opportunity of fundamental now is extreme. So if you have the ability to think three or four or five years is incredible opportunity. The problem is on a 12 to 18 month time scale, you can buy something extraordinarily cheap like you recommended. And literally, if it's against the prevailing factor trends, you're gonna get pounded every day until those factors flip. So, you know, it doesn't matter how much value it has, the idiosyncratic can get more and more mispriced in so much as the systematic trends are against which creates more and more alpha and more and more opportunity, but you also have this issue of how long can I hold on? And the magnitude's much different too. So if I go back, look, flows have always been part of the market, and uh, you know whether it's flows from people buying mutual funds or flows from people buying indexes, passive has become uh, a behemoth and is certainly driving everything. But if I say, you know, and this is this is just for for ex explanatory purposes. But, you know, 10 years ago, um, if I was betting against some type of flows or I knew that I was being contrarian, um, I might lose, and, and let's do it in alpha terms because the market can go anywhere, but I might lose five or 10 points of alpha over a six-month window while I'm waiting and then hoping to make, say, 40 points of alpha. And so it was worth dealing with that pain of being contrarian to get paid. Now you can lose 40 points of alpha while you're waiting. And so now you have to make like a hundred <laughs> to correct it. And so the penalty for going against these trends is so extreme that nobody can really do it and stay in business. And so you have to be kind of a ninja in timing this stuff, which is, you know, impossible. Um, and so you, you have to be much smarter about portfolio construction. You have to be much smarter about identifying how against these prevailing themes there are. And then the other thing is to your point about, you know, the, the value of the fundamental analyst, um, you know, to his point on charter, we see this happening all the time where you get exactly what you hope for. It, it proves to the market your fundamental view was correct. It goes up for a day or two and then right back goes back on the same trend it was. And so all these people who are trying to do their job, they're they're just getting slapped every time they're even. And that's when they're correct. When they're wrong, they're losing way more than that. <laughs> yeah, you made a great point. Let's take one step further. Think about August 2007, right? The fundamental managers and the quant managers were on the opposite side. Quants were long value and momentum, the traditional guys. A lot of fundamental managers were long growth. As, my, as I started getting torn apart because you had a 27% correction in value in three days, I had guys from, that run growth funds calling me being like, 
I'm crushing it. What's going on? Like all my growth stocks are up as I'm de-risking. De now we live in a world where you get so penalized for going against the grain that everybody's virtually on the same side with the exception of these type of strategies. But in the traditional fundamental world, risk premia and fundamental, you get really penalized. So what I think happens now is you get both sets of quants and fundamental, traditional quants, not, not the sophisticated stuff you do, on the same side of the boat, which means the unwind can be epic. Because everybody, and I actually think personally, um, if you're trading thousand securities, liquidity is good. If you need to trade with speed, liquidity is horrific. So if we go negative momentum and negative growth and people actually have to sell, watch out. Okay, I would like, to, I don't know, I would like to add one comment regarding the mix of people in hedge fund. I think it's a super interesting issue. I think like the industry actually, it's terrible at hiring. Like the, you go from a niche industry from 100 billion to three and a half trillion. Instead, the hiring is still episodic. It's not a science. Like, you know, big banks go and hire people in colleges. Hedge fund, they've not matured in creating a bench, training. It's something that can be thought. As far as the talent, I used to use this analogy. The great traders of the 80s and 90s were like John McEnroe. Amazing talent, scrawny body, like, you know, like the, the, you know, but they were good with the volley and they, even the basketball play with the lanky thing, the ridiculous short and so on. If Mekero today tried to play with Djokovic, it would be destroyed because the players today not only have talent, they do crossfit, they do weights, they do specific training. You look at the body of LeBron James, of Djokovic, it's not like some of the soccer players, Lucas Ronaldo, imagine Platini look like my dad, like he just had a nice touch <laughs> with the foot. So what I'm saying that, yeah, you can have the talent of the Macro, but if you don't do portfolio construction, if you're not thoughtful about all the other pieces, just having a good idea of what central bank do, it's just not gonna cut it. You're gonna be the makers of struggling there and being crushed. I, I have one kind of personal wrap up question and that is, I think what we've heard from, correct me if I'm wrong, Jason, and perhaps Tim, is to, to uh, put in place and execute a more traditional strategy you have to be willing to deal, you have to time arbitrage and be willing to deal with volatility. I think what Dario pushed would say, and we've talked about this, is I'm maximizing sharp, or that's one of the key um, uh, constraints. A strategy like you're espousing probably has a low sharp. So as we think about investing, do we have to make that decision? In other words, do we have to mentally say, look, we're going to hold traditional fundamental strategies for the upside, and we will deal with a lower sharp? Or, and, or do we want uh, high sharp strategies? Or do I have it wrong? Because this is important. Risk-adjusted returns, it's not just returns. It's risk-adjusted returns. I, I think it depends on your time horizon. Um, and... You know, I would say for fundamental views, you absolutely have to be willing to have lower sharps. Um, there is more vol that's in the market. You know, you can take any cluster of Buffett's years, um, not the totality of it, but, you know, call it five or ten year windows, and he had horrible sharps in many of those windows. I mean, he had 50 percent drawdowns four times over the, you know, probably 40 years of his compounding. Um, I, you know, we at the end of the day, and, and, and I used to be a, a full quant, but, you know, we have kind of a joke in our, in our firm, which is the best form of risk management is being right. Um, and, and what I mean by that is, is if you own a company that you buy at a good or reasonable valuation and they grow their cash flows 200% over a five to 10 year window, you are making money. I don't care what happens. I don't care what happens to multiples. I don't care what happens to the market. I don't care what happens to macro. I don't care what Trump says. You are making money if you own an asset that grows its cash flow by two to 300% and you buy it well, period. 
Now, there might be a lot of vol along the way, um, or the same thing on the short side. If you're short something that looks like Bed Bath & Beyond um, or looks like a mall that's cash flows go down by 90% over a 15-year window, you're definitely making money over that period. And so at the end of the day for me, it comes down to what happens with the fundamentals of those companies and, and did you buy them or short them well, uh, and, and that's it. I, I'm not going to answer your question, but I'm going to say something that's very related. If we go back 20 years and we measure rolling standard deviation, so rolling volatility of the market, and then we take things like momentum or growth and value, and we compare the volatilities of those factors to the market's volatility, what we would historically always find is market volatility is here, and those factors represent a portion of market volatility. The pendulum has swung so far in favor of systematic that since late 2014, persistently, factor volatilities are now here and market volatility is down here. Said another way, I don't even think you can properly identify anymore what your beta to the market is. Said another way, um, if you're $100 long value last year, in $30 short growth, I perceive you as a net short fund but while being 70% net long. This is a whole new paradigm. Uh, actually, you know, systemat good systematic trading doesn't look as sharp. <laughs> you know, like actually sharp doesn't even control probability of drawdown a short time scale. What's your probability of having a 5% down next week has nothing to do with sharp. It's all controlled by the tail of the distribution, the amount of risk you're running. Over a long time period, the probability of drawdown are controlled by sharp because you have the cumulative and you know it becomes Gaussian and all of that. That's another area where actually humans are actually good. Humans have a good sense of risk reward, and traditional systematic didn't because maximizing sharp and mean variance, they would identify risk with volatility. If you want to do good risk adjusted return, you should keep the probability of drawdown within order over time, uniform. And to do that, you need to control other things, downside volatility, sortino, and sharp just doesn't cut it. And actually, if you do that, you get a form of artificial intelligence that is similar to humans. as a natural threshold below which the holdings go to zero because the machine is saying, with this left tail and weak signal, I don't think it's a good idea to get involved. Instead, the most traditional one would say, as long as positive expected value, knock yourself out with leverage and you're going to be okay. So I would say it needs to be more human with proper statistical inference and that's having terms that are not just sharp. Is, is it safe to say that because machine learning requires such large data sets that a lot is presently being done on price? Yes. So the degree of technical trading in the market has gone up exponentially? Yes. I would say that, especially at the time scale, generally people care. It's, you can have contextual variable like steepness of the rates curve, some more fundamental thing, but the main driver at the low hanging fruit to unlock the nonlinear stuff is mostly technical. Right. Yeah. That is a very. Oh, sorry, we have another question. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Do you have a machine learning? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what is yeah, this? Sorry, just one, one last question. Uh. Uh, I think there is a lot, the human factor is very much in the, the way you build the features. The machine itself, it's pretty agnostic, like, you know, to build a proper machine, like artificial intelligence, especially for financial forecast, it's pretty agnostic. Um, 
all the work of humans is really the selection of the features, but then also you use machine learning. The thing that makes it the most similar to humans, in my opinion, that finally, and it's very different from image recognition, we finally actually managed to have this form of intelligence that is aware of its own learning, and so that can deal with the flexibility of the market. I was saying before, like, the act of learning something about the markets and deploying capital to it changes the dynamics of the market itself. Noise can become signal. If a random event, people start buying into that and deploying capital to it, it can become real. And signal can become back noise. And uh, that's the only thing that happens is markets are like living organisms, a social Thing. Like people can go crazy if they don't have feedback loop from people. Like the way he looks at me, I, you know, the way I'm aware of the feeling of other people when I'm talking to them. So I would say that it's very much human in its awareness and its doubt, self-doubt of its understanding. And what is left for humans is really to design the feature and be very thoughtful about, you know, how to feed that into the machine. Very good. Listen, I want to thank all three of these speakers. They did a great job. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Just a few housekeeping items before we go. Um, I want to remind you to fill out your comment cards. Otherwise, Connie will not let me back in the office. Um, so on um, June 21st, uh, Michael Castine is putting together a, a terrific panel. Uh, the title is The Most Profitable Business in the World, uh, Monetizing the Asset Management Business Model. No pressure. Uh, Michael's also putting together a session on the uh, intellectual capital flows um, of um, and competing with the likes of Google and Sand Hill Road. Um, Connie has also um, wrestled me to the ground on this one. Um, she's... Um, uh, lobbied for more social gatherings in 23 years. I can count the social events we've had on one hand, and I'm missing a finger. So she's um, she's said that we need to get together more often. Uh, the last time I remember we got together was with um, Ryan Dartnell. He got us into the Museum of the 60s and the Woodstock site up at Bethel Woods. So just to give you some coming attractions, and hopefully we'll come up with another um, event like that. Uh, in July, uh, Lucy Stitzer, who some of you may know, um, is putting together a session called um, Agricultural Technology 2.0, uh, the new infra infrastructure play. Uh, and then finally, we've got some wild cards with Peter Lawrence and his uh, blockchain uh, session and um, Brian Furtado, who originally did the big data session uh, two years ago, which was uh, tremendous, turned us on to this whole uh, movement. And um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, Phil Zecker for taking over the programming committee, giving Ray a break uh, for four years. And Phil's um, already started on a good road. And if you have any ideas um, or suggestions, uh, please um, either get them to Connie or Phil. And um, we look forward to it. But again, I want to thank the panelists. Ray, you put together a terrific session. Jason, Tim, Dario, good job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.